Hello, and welcome to Boundless and Bottomless Seas, a project of Varnblog, Antifada, The Regrettable Century, um, and hosted here at Varnblog, uh, although audio form is available behind many people's patron walls, so... And I have uh, to the YouTube comments from the last video being like, where's that third guy? <laughs> third guy's back, I'm back. There yeah, uh, yeah, third guy's back. Uh, he missed the second half of chapter one, which also ended up being Varn and Jason complain oh, about history. Yeah, for three hours. <laughs> yeah, you were like, before this, you were like, oh, I can send you the file. But I was like, I'll watch it on YouTube and an hour and a half in. I'm like, oh my God, these guys did some work. <laughs> they fucking did it. Respect. Um, so, chapter two. Chapter two, Dasein is actor. And we already know before we even dig into the chapter that one, we're fucking dealing with Heidegger. Two, yeah. um, we're dealing with the paradox of a form of being as an actor, which is a form of act becoming. I don't know. Um, you guys are going to have to walk me through this Heidegger thing, man. I'm a deeply unphilosophical person. Uh, well, I mean, you could be a deeply philosophical person and not understand Heidegger. There. Um, so, I mean, for Heidegger, Dasein is actually an actor. The entity, um, literally, if you look up, like, uh, and being in time, like, yeah, being in time, um, the entity which of each of us is himself, we shall denote by the term Dasein. Dasein is the entity in which being has this very being as an issue which means uh i don't know because we have a person in heidegger defined also as a being there or their being are rooted in existence and rooted in a place in existence so it's like a node um a terroir also yeah i mean it is um i will also just say very quickly if only so that uh varn can uh, can educate us both but i am not at all clear on exactly how being in the world is distinct enough to be its own kind of subject at least so far um this is to try to get you out of all right i gotta put on my hegel hat um, put it on put it on it's early right. go for it all right so in hegel you have becoming as a category which is contrasted with permanent being or form as a category yeah. or the category as pure essence all right so in hegel you have essence and action um dasein is in my understanding, an attempt to get out of that bind where you're either becoming, you know, Hegel, uh, Heraclitus, Nietzsche, etc., or static being, Zeno, Parmenides, maybe Plato, maybe Socrates, um, kind of Aristotle, sort of not really. Um, Dasein is a way to say, okay, we're rooting this not in essences or forms, but we're also not just rooting this in relationality, all right? Because relationality is collective. Whereas, no, we are rooting this in individuality from which you are birthed, as in this place in the world, the there in which you are. Now, you, there's some people pointing out that, like, maybe there's some relations to, to German forms of fascism in this. I don't know. I actually, I think... I can see it, but I also don't necessarily see it. This also sounds like very existential, like you're getting out of the whole becoming problem by trying to root being and becoming into the same thing. Um, and the reason why you'd want to do that is it makes authenticity not just a category of like relation, but truth to yourself and where you're from. Okay. Um, so... Uh, but Heidegger's Dasein is mystified. I mean, basically, if you've ever read the Adorno's jargon of authenticity, Adorno's whole claim about Heideggerians, and he's not so much attacking Heidegger directly, but he is kind of talking about this. The Dasein's a language construct that like really is 
totally mystified. Um, and the reason why is Dasein is is um, is obscured by, according to Heidegger, language itself, everyday curiosity, logical systems, and common belief, um, which obscure your nature of your own existence from yourself. So you're alienated from yourself, and your Dasein is alienated from your Dasein. Um, and authentic choice for Heidegger means turning away from the collective world of them from relation to face one's own individuality in the context of one's own being, in the context of one's own birth, terror, etc. Okay, so this is both, this is uh, environmental and individualistic as opposed to relational or, or formal. You know, the other form of individuality is, you know, you are a pre-existing form a la uh, Socrates and Plato, and you have all knowledge of yourself already. Um, you just have to unobscure your, you have to forget the, the falseness of you. Um, although there, if you kind of look at this, you can see a relation here between, between the kind of Socratic notion of this and like the authentic choice, meaning getting out of language, getting out of, uh, you know, simple curiosity, getting out of formal logical systems, etc. Um, you can also see how this could be construed in being, you know, uh, as kind of irrationalist. Um, but there's a couple of things in it um, that are, you know, being as always the being of an entity of a singular identity. All right. Um, and that's that's clear in being in time. Now you might go, well, why would someone who's got an, a a kind of collective view of uh, of identity like Dugan like this? Well, and it's because Dasein is not atomized individualism. Right. It's individualism from from a context or even a soil mm -hmm. in which you are born. A yeah. Block, presumably, maybe, too. Yeah. Or is it not, is Heidegger's not a racialist vision? Well, Heide okay, Heidegger's racialist racialism is a little bit, uh, um, is a little bit murdy. If you read the Black Books, for example, like his anti-Semitism isn't a pure blood anti-Semitism. It's like kind of like a, a rejection. Like Jewishness is a rejection of Gentileness and Germanness, etc. So it's a it is a collective relation that refuses a to, uh, the kind of being from which it emerges uh, from its own soil, um, and also that uh, by cutting itself apart and. Um, and claiming superiority, they're actually coming up with a theory of race from which we should hold them accountable and find them wanting. That's like in the black books. Mm. So um, there's a little bit of that, although Heidegger is weird about it. So in one uh, in one question, when he was asked about blood and soil rhetoric, and you can even find this on Wikipedia, uh, Heidegger is quoted as saying, there is much talk nowadays of blood and soil as frequently invoked powers, literati, whom come across, whom one comes across even today, have already seized hold of them. Blood and soil are certainly powerful and necessary, but they are not sufficient co condition for a design of a people. And this is why you're going to see Dugan sees on this as sort of like emergent, but more than Nazism, because Nazism is like kind of blood and soilism. Uh, and while, yes, uh, Heidegger was a Nazi, uh, there's no way around that, um, that he did not see German identity as just a matter of um, being from German soil and having German ancestry. He also saw it as, you know, um, being called together by a common context so soil here and ground here and environment here is larger than just like you know normal nationalist or anti-enlightenment blood and soil rhetoric but i mean we do have to like you can also find this on wikipedia um you you can all um 
he did invoke Dasein specifically when endorsing the Nazis in November of 1933. And I'll read that quote to you. The German people have been summoned by the Fuhrer to vote. The Fuhrer, however, is asking nothing from the people. Rather, he is giving the people the possibility of making directly the highest free decision of all. Whether it, the entire people, want its own existence, Dasein, or whether it does not want it. On November 12th, the German people as a whole chose its future, and its fu in this future is bound to the Fuhrer. Ellipses. There are not separate foreign and domestic policies. There is only the will to the full existence of our Dasein of the state. The Fuhrer has awakened this will in the entire people and has held it to a single into a single resolve. So Dasein is perfectly uh, consistent with integralism or corporatism a la Mussolini and um, and that corporate version can be manifested in an individual person. Um, so Dasein is hard to get your head around because it is both an individual, but in Heidegger's notion of being, you can be nested in multiple Dasein. Mm. So you have your own authentic choice to make, but also the choice of your people, also the choice of say Europe, etc. And there's no way to, once you've, once you've chosen to be a part of this existence of this Dasein, you're in it. But you'll notice that unlike say, in Hegel, where these relationships are relational, like you have a relationship to, you know, the the state or whatever, or in Marx, like you have an emergent relationship to because of your mode of production, right? Um, this is, you know, once this has happened, once you have willed this, once you've made this existential choice, you are both your own authenticity and part of the authenticity of a people or other entity. So these are multiple invested singular beings. All right. And I think that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it I, I think a lot of people really trip up on what this means, but I, I hope that helps people because it's like, oh, very helpful. I it, think people I... trip up on it because everyone, I mean, not everyone, but in general, there's a desire to, to make everything as clear as possible and as simple as possible. And so if it's complica complex or if it's overlapping, then it is too much and th you have to go back to the drawing board but i think if it's not if if it's not too much then it's not enough you know right so one way you to think about this is i talk about this in uh and sometimes in terms of like the difference between aggregates and and collectives so in marx for example and to tie this into the way lukash would explain marx the aggregate makes history, but an aggregate is not a conscious collective. The aggregate is like the, it's like, so, so the class aggregate is a class in itself. Right. All right. It's just an aggregated mass that is, that is defined mutually by a mode of production. Um, but once the class becomes for itself, it is properly speaking, something that which you have a collective relation. Now it's still not one thing. And Marx, like, but these are kind of different categories, and the the bet like the aggregate versus collective, which they seem like they're the same thing, but they're not, um, because the collective is self conscious, whereas the aggregate is not, is one of the easiest ways in English to explain this difference. Mm. And in Heidegger, the aggregate just kind of doesn't matter. That's the them who gives a shit. The collective matters mm. because you will it. All right. As a you know, so um, Heidegger actually, I mean, Heidegger actually explicitly acknowledges like he got some of this from engaging with Marx mm -hmm. uh, and trying to like reconcile and move past like you know the the Nietzsche Hegel problem because mm -hmm. Heidegger was engaging with both Hegel and Nietzsche uh, never engaged with each other directly. Um, so, all right, so we have Dasein as actor and we have the stage and problem in the development of for political theory. Um, now what is interesting already out the bat, all right, we, we've been trying to figure out in what ways is, um, is Dugan a rationalist and what ways is he an irrationalist? Like when we were talking about last time, sometimes he reads like he's an Alex Jones fan. That's way more complicated. And other times he reads like he's got something very, 
elaborate going on, right? That is worked out more Baudrillard and Derrida than than say Alex Jones. Um, we get a hint in this first chapter, like in the in the second paragraph. I reject Francis Bacon. Yeah. Boom, flat yeah. out. Like we don't care about scientific methodology. <laughs> Positivism but, out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think he, I think, but it's not just, it's not just normal positivism. Like, it's not like I reject the logical positivist school. It's I reject it at root. I reject it at, at the moment that Francis Bacon kind of, you know, as I always like to take it, tried to take a dialectic between imperialism and, I mean, not imperialism, empiricism right. and rationalism and come up with a methodology like that checked rationalism by empiricism. And uh, Dugan saying, I don't believe in that. <laughs> like, it's actually kind of refreshing for someone just to say it. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And, and to say it so quickly, because he ends the paragraph by just saying, I propose to move on. Like, one paragraph should cover this, because that's not even the main point. Mm -hmm. um, then we get his endorsement of where he gets this fourth political theory kind of coming from. Um. And that's Elaine de Benoit's against liberalism towards a fourth political theory. So de Benoit, who is a, a weird creature of the French New Right, one of the co-founders of Greca. Um, now, I could get into the fine grain of the French New Right, but... Uh, They've been very influential with, like, the new identitarian movement and, like, um, mm -hmm. sort of, um, what a, like, allegedly non-rationalist communitarianism within Europe, right? Yeah, although, I mean, De Benoit is interesting because he hedges his bets on racial, because racialists like him, hmm. right? Like, Richard Spencer was always also, you know, talking about De Benoit, but De Benoit is not really a racialist. Um, although he did he did pick up on that uh, human, human diversity talk for people who don't remember the 90s. Hmm. Uh, human biodiversity was a movement by liberals to like save, you know, indigenous peoples that got adopted by racialist pretty quickly, like, like within a couple of years of it coming into existence as a way to say like, well, we, you know, racialists, we recognize plurality of the world. We're pretending not to be supremacist, uh, but uh, we got to keep our own selves pure. And by that, I mean, don't intermarry with anyone and make us all brown. Cause that'll, that, uh, that makes us one race and we can't have that. Um, so De Benoit is like liked in those circles and uses some of that language, but he, he tends to avoid explicit racialism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably because like, if you want to not totally divide up France, being a racialist is kind of a problem. And, and this is similar to if people know about like Brazilian integralism, which is a, also a fascist or post-fascist philosophy that rejects like Nazi racialism because it's like, well, we're Brazilian. We can't have racialism. But if you, if you, you know, buy into true Brazilian and true European culture, then we're okay with you regardless of your race. Right. Um, which is closer to like Evola and that like Evola's notion of spiritual races. Like anyone can become part of the spiritual race if they embrace, you know, what it means to be an Italian or Roman. Uh, or Italian least, truth. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what's going on here. And uh, it's interesting, you know, to think about this coming out 11 years ago, right? Well, not 11 years ago. Uh, I think you said 14 years ago it came out in Russian, right? And then 11 Well, years more than that now. It'd be 15 years ago. But years. yeah, um, when we started, it was 14 years ago. I don't know what month it came out in Russia. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I guess in English, it's been around for now 12 years. So, um, Indeed it has, yeah. so First English edition published in, two, in 2012. Yeah. Yep. Um, both English editions, both the kind of informal one I mentioned by Sabovda and then the Millerman Sabovda combined translation, which is the main one come out in the same year. Um, but it's interesting that you, there's still whiffs of alter globalization in this. And I think it's kind of interesting, too, if we put ourselves back into 2012 modes, 
like there's stuff there's hints in this about what he's talking about that would have been more apparent to us i probably think at the time because the the concern about globalization um as part of uh the process here was a concern that at 2011 2012 was manifested in two places the alter globalization movement and right-wing conspiracy world against the new york order but they hadn't even like combined the two into globalism yet like that's uh right, right yeah globalism that's a, like, a post trump uh well system. yeah i i started seeing it in right-wing circles right before trump but yeah you know which was their way of like we're anti-globalism as opposed to anti-globalization because anti-globalization is leftist right um and also, we can like throw in some JJ Bolshevik conspiracies and other fun stuff in that if we like rebuild yeah. it. Right. Um, so, while know. also pointing to some like um, popular, famous, uh, world trotting political actors and economic actors that can be a stand in for this like semi anti Semitic uh, conspiracy, conspiracy theory vision of uh, world mm. change. Because you can look at Davos, of course, right? Which, and, right. Uh, World Economic Forum, which becomes the great bugbears for them. I mean, it's interesting because Dugan can kind of have it both ways. Like he will, if you if you watch him engage with other groups, he will occasionally make four ways into that kind of stuff. Um, you know, Soros conspiracy stuff like that. But you don't get the sense that he actually. Well, I don't know if he believes it because we've already read in the last chapter a bit, like. He actually takes a lot of like the dumb American left views uh, uh, describing um, uh, like American politics and takes them at face value. <laughs> like, um, or like, like his characterization of George Bush is like a, is like a, you know, like a silly fundy was like, yeah, God made me do it. I'm not sure I remember Bush ever actually saying that. Yeah, that was, oh, that was, I, I remember Bush saying that, but I don't remember him saying anything else that, that would give weight to that as being as indicative of what he actually thought about the world. Mm -hmm. But I do I mean, remember him saying that. I remember everyone making a big deal about it, and I remember thinking it's not that big of a deal. I mean, you got to remember, unfortunately, it doesn't really actually represent anything. We have to go back to 2007. I mean, one of the things that makes reading this book interesting now, and maybe why some people don't catch parts of it, is like you have to put yourself back in an aughts like world time frame. Yeah. Um, and do you remember when everybody, I mean, I guess they're that way again, because we're back to Christian nationalism conspiracies, but like, um, as if that stands a chance in a population that's like the people under 40 are only 50% religious. Um, uh, and not even <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, anyway, um, the, uh, in the if we go back to the aughts, and this was in my time period of when I was on the right, and it used to just really annoy me, even though I hated George Bush. Do you guys remember all the dominionism fears? You know, yes. like people oh, like yeah. Jeff, Christopher Jeff, Hedges, Hedges, Chris Christopher Hedges, Hedges, Jeff Charlotte, a bunch of names that have come back, actually. You know, I think uh, stuff. Max Blumenthal, right? Wrote a book, uh American Gomorrah. Oh yeah. Right. About yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, dominionism and all that yeah yeah that was very much tied into like the uh the the, the new atheist thing right you had like the right, yeah. war on terror moment too and uh you know fighting uh islamofascism abroad but also like fight you know it, it, it's uh yeah. it's a moment in time it but was uh, that's coming back yeah well i don't know the new atheism is but i do feel like a lot of the fear of that is coming back because yeah. You know, you know how liberals are. They always like to fight the battle that they kind of won last time, barely. Um, except that, yeah, like, if New ahead. Atheism is coming back at all, it's coming back exclusively in liberal quarters. But uh, it's not really taking off in the same way. It doesn't have nearly as much of a hold on anybody, as far as I can tell, anyways. Well, I mean, the other thing is it's had an influence on the right, too. Like, And, uh, and the weird, like, if you're looking for um, reactionary social uh judicial decisions and legislation a lot of that not just in theory but in uh, like judicial practice is coming not from crazy southern baptists and method and like uh, dispensationalists and whatever it's coming from catholics who are actually very intellectual oh, yeah. about it 
and and many people on like the intellectual dark web or whatever you want to call that like weird classical liberal like university of austin thing who are doing it in a secularized way so the panic feels like this this attempt to try to bring us back 20 years ago to when there actually was this kind of full thread that the 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 three stool um the, the three-legged stool of the Republican Party still included evangelicals as like a large, large basis. Uh, it's retreading ground that I think has been evacuated in a lot of ways. It's kind yeah. of this nostalgia for our, our last panic. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my big thing is like James Lindsay, the guy who wrote a book with Peter, with Peter Bogosian about how to create atheists is now like talking about how all the communists are Gnostics, but he's still an atheist. Right. So like... <laughs> Still refuses to be an anti-Semite, although if you follow the logic of his argument, all of the all of the the postmodern neo-Marxist stuff, like the conspiracy of DEI and wokeism yeah. or whatever, is kind of structurally anti-Semitic to begin with. So methinks James Lindsay doth protest too much. I don't know. I, I mean, but I do think it's interesting where like new atheism ended up. Most of it just became milk toast liberalism. I've listened to some former new atheist podcasts that are basically just like democratic party bad joke podcast, but every now and then Sports on TV. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> every now and then you'll get someone like uh, a Dawkins or whoever, who's just moved are are that whole conference. There's this whole conference, uh, like this Jesus mysticism conference that all became like IDW adjacent and Trump supporting like the entire conference did. So uh, it's interesting that, that, you know, there are people who want to fight that battle, but it's like new atheists are not even all like the old new atheists are not even all on one side now. Like, um, so, uh, we have the, the announcement of, of liberalism, you know, these are the next the next couple of sections, but this is where it gets interesting. I was like, "So, what is Dugan gonna do?" Dave Benoit, Heidegger, Emmanuel Wallerstein, <laughs> like, <laughs> and yes, yes, children, he does do this. Or it does, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I just, <laughs> there's another. I'll just read this. There's another aspect worth mentioning in regards to the title of Dave Benoit's book. After many readers will remember another ideological manifesto directed against liberalism called After Liberalism by Emmanuel Wallerstein. There's also an After Liberalism uh, by uh, by Paul Gottfried. <laughs> There's a lot of books with that name. But um, despite the similarity in their titles and the object of, crimin- uh, of criticism, there is significant difference. Wallerstein criticizes liberalism from the point of view of the left, from the neo-Marxist position. And I like... okay. This is where I'm going to go into some history. I don't think people often realize that world systems theory is a neo-Marxist position. That's not just a slur. Um, because it came out of debates between post-Marxist and analytic Marxists. And political Marxism and world systems theory were kind of opposed. One vaguely whiffs of Trotskyism, one vaguely whiffs of Maoism. Right. But they weren't, they weren't truly Maoist or truly Trotskyist. All right. And they kind of came out of the debates between the post Marxists on one hand, you know, Leotard, uh, Baudrillard, a bunch of French guys, really. Um, and the analytic Marxist who wanted to, like, instead of, you know, getting rid of the Marx part of the materialist part of Marx or the Marx part of Marx, as I like to call it, uh, they, they wanted to get rid of the. The, well, they want to get rid of the Hegelian part of Marx. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. They say they wanted to get rid of the Hegelian part of Marx, and like Cohen did, but they also wanted to get rid of labor theory of value. Well, yeah, they, they also they, want to get uh, get rid of the Marx part of Marx, but the other Marx part of Marx, right? <laughs> like, like they were replaced. Like, we're going to get rid of Hegelianism, rational choice theory. We're going to favor methodological individualism, which okay. That's a misunderstanding anyway, because Marx Marx is not a methodological collectivist. Um, uh, we're going to get rid of labor theory of value. Okay, and uh, to be fair, everybody got rid of labor theory of value for a long time. I think we forget this. Like, Zizek doesn't believe in labor theory of value either, although he can't tell you what it is. Um, well, yeah, uh, neither can uh, 
David Harvey or anybody else who's gotten rid of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but Wallerstein and Wallerstein and Arigi take like the regulation school and the long durée school and they attach Marxism to it mm-hmm. as a way out of these debates. Mm-hmm. So because Brunel, Brunel, the, the other world systems guy is not a Marxist. He's, he's a, a Smithian, region. right? Yeah. He's a Smithian. And then you have like, and that's why some people call um, like world system theory, like Smithian Marxism, or as I like to call it, uh, Maoism with Ricardian characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, Commercial, uh, commercialization theory, Maoism or something. Yeah. Like that. yeah. Um, so, you know, um, but, you know, and I don't dislike uh, Wallerstein, but I think, I think when, when people see, oh, he's calling Wallerstein neo, neo Marxist, this is like some Jordan Peterson, I slur in this case, it's technically true. Yeah. I didn't take it that way. Right. I'm not sure you guys would, but I'm I don't I'm not sure our audiences would necessarily get that. Uh because neo-Marxism got uh you know g- because liberals started saying neo-Marxism was a way to say Judeo Bolshevism. Right. Um which well and, and to be fair, for a lot of people and even maybe most people, that's probably it true. is. Yeah. <laughs> like um I but I don't think that's what not to defend Dugan on much, but I don't think that's what Dugan's doing here. I think he's just being like technically correct. Like, um, anyway, it happens and, a lot with Dugan, actually. He's yeah. technically correct. And so saying that is uncomfortable, but it's just, it's just something that needs to be said. Yeah. Right. And yeah, let's get back to this. And like any Marxist, he sees liberalism, bourgeois democracy, and capitalism as a phase of historical development, which is compressed. Com- com- uh, progressive in comparison to the preceding phases of development, such as feudalism or slavery, but inferior to what will come after it, socialism, communism, and so forth. I mean, I think that's actually true of classical Marxism, but it is interesting how many Marxists, including probably most of us here, <laughs> who are like, yeah, I'm not sure that everything's going to be progressive. Um, and I'm not always sure Marx thought that because his, because like his theories of... Re- like Marx does play with theories of regression and like his theory of bonapartism and whatnot, which in the case that he didn't think that everything was clearly teleological, or at least he didn't sometimes. Um, right. There's, there's this, there's a way in which Marxism becomes popularized and the, the notion of progress becomes linear and mm-hmm. people forget the cor- the corkscrew uh, progression, but yeah. if, if a, a very serious actual student of Lenin is not that kind of Marxist. Right. There are very few of those nowadays, but there are, you know, a few of them, like a few of us still. It shouldn't surprise us that a man who grew up in the Soviet Union in what the 70s and 80s has a very sort of vulgarized conception of uh, right. yeah, exactly. materialism. Yeah. Um, uh, to be, I mean, I think this is fair. I, I think he's also fair to point out that after liberalism actually has a teleology attached to it. You know, right? Yeah, just like you know, I was like, like Mandel's late capitalism, which I'm like, you know, that was really optimistic of you <laughs> years ago. Um, uh, typical no, we used it up until recently, right? Yeah. <laughs> we all did. Uh, for but he's using Wallerstein here as a contrast, although he's going to come back to Wallerstein for De Benoit, the superiority of liberalism other other types of society, nor the advantages of communists are obvious. What's interesting about De Benoit is David Wall actually agrees a lot with the post-Marxist and Baudrillard and whatnot. It's like, well, you know, it's all kind of equal anyway. Hmm. Like these are, they're not equal because, you know, I don't share these values. I'm not part of this Dasein, but like there, there is no teleological progression of anything. Right. Um, and if any, you know, and this kind of goes in two ways. In Greco, which is this group that Dave and Juan was associated with, there's another guy called Gula Mefe, um, who came up with this concept called archaeofuturism, which is oh, exactly right. as weird as you sound. It sounds like like it's this idea of like we're going to the past and the future simultaneously, you know. Um, which I don't know. I mean, that kind of just feels like fascism to me. They claim the same thing, but whatever. Um, well, there, you know, it, it kind of does feel like fascism, but it's not. It's not necessarily explicitly such, you know, like there's, there's an entirely different discussion we could have at some point about 
sublation and what it means. Mm-hmm. There, there's a way in which you know maybe archaeofuturism is is reactionary, but there's another way in which that kind of thinking is not necessarily reactionary. But I think that's probably outside the scope. Yeah, I, well, I, just to defend your little assertion uh, a little bit, um, that's clear in De Brumaire by Marx, because he always talks about you always have to go to the future by basically play acting the past, or as I like to call the eternal LARP theory of, of, of change. Um, That's true. <laughs> what was it called? Archeofuturism? Uh, archeofuturism. Uh, so uh, so maybe Giannis Varoufakis is an archeofuturist. Maybe we're having an archeofuturist moment as techno-feudalism, techno-neo-feudalism has a real moment among the intelligentsia, right? There yeah. is, this, and of course, this day is growing. You're, you might be making it a little bit more... Uh, clear and intellectually serious than it is but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but it's, it's, it's a valid attempt yeah, yeah see, see our episode on uh eugenie morosov's d- uh breakdown of of uh techno neo feudalism which we definitely agree with morosov in fact maybe oh, yeah in fact maybe we think morosov is too nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so he, but Wallerstein's interesting here because, uh, although I, there's some, he, Dugan makes some crazy about Wallerstein. It's interesting. I'll, I'll actually I'll get to that. According to Wallerstein, the end of liberalism is a foregone conclusion, according to the very logic of the social, political, and social economic history. Yet he easily spoke of an after. For Benoit, the question remains one must fight against liberalism, yet in this morally and historically justified struggle there is no guaranteed result what's interesting is i think most marxist i mean i think we are all i mean i hate to say that i agree with David on anything yeah. but i actually do agree with that there are no promised results no, no well no. yeah if the dichotomy is only between benoit and wallerstein then yeah sure <laughs> i mean well, what is the 20th century except no guaranteed results <laughs> right and the center kicking everyone's ass just by surviving. Right. I mean, that's part of the thesis of this book is like, well, the first political theory happens to still be around. Yeah. Like, everybody else lost. Um, it's around in such a in such a way that it's like part of the almost like the built environment now. It's like a it's that management of things moment, right? Yeah. It's so yeah, around gets, that it's like beyond itself almost. He gets into that a little bit, like you know later in this chapter where he talks about like conservatism but liberal conservatism is not an, a solution because it's just liberalism but with different social values and yeah. I, I just like that he does that i just think that's that's honest you know what i find interesting he does see that he he makes a claim about wallerstein that i actually don't think is true about wallerstein to be fair he says wallerstein in varying degrees views things mechanically like any Marxist, whereas De Benoit is organicist and holist, like any real conservative. And I'm like, I agree what he says about De Benoit. I actually don't think Wallerstein's a mechan- uh, mechanist. I don't think he, I don't think Wallerstein actually thinks that uh, revolution is automatic. Or no. I mean, I remember, from, from reading I remember, his book. Yeah, and his commentary too, right? Because up until his death four or five years ago, right? It was like a, a pretty... He was, he was commenting on current events and he was very much like vacillating between um, hope and despair as us all, as we all were, right? It's kind of like him saying yeah, any I, Marxist, like any Marxist when it comes to a, a product of Soviet education, sure. But I'm, I right. would consider myself a Marxist and not at all a uh, mechanic, mechan- mechanist. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a mechanist, even though even though I do have a strong dash of what you know, those of us who are into to the block say is the cold stream of Marxism. There's a there's an icy little stream flowing through my veins uh, about like what you can't do. Um, <laughs> uh, but actually, it's interesting. I think I'm only a cold stream Marxist when it talk when we're talking about what we can't do, not what we can. <laughs> like. I'm still I'm I'm not a I'm not a mechanicist when it comes to like the inevitability of proletarian revolution, but I still hold on to like the very weak like teleology of the dynamic of like capital accumulation and the sort of like 
th this like mechanistic drive that capital has. But I think that's a very historically specific thing, and it doesn't have to end itself in proletarian revolution. In fact, it looks like it's going to probably end itself in a global nuclear exchange. Yeah, so or, there's like different mechan you know, mech me mechanicisms working here. That's why a purely only cold stream all the time or an only warm stream all the time is not, a, is not, a, neither one of those is acceptable. Tepid neither, <laughs> but, yeah, but neither is a tepid stream. I think I said this, I think I said this at, uh, at some point. You need a very hot and a very cold pool and you have to jump back and forth between the two. But you yeah. don't need a, a third pool with a mixture of the two because then you just have lukewarm water. <laughs> the math theory of, uh, of world history. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I'll back it up because I, I'm normally a super big Hal Draper fan, but I read one of his attempts to like square the circle of uh, of socialism as inevitable, but also barbarism as a possibility in his socialism or barbarism, a much abused phrase essay. And I was just like, you know, you actually can't make that work. <laughs> like, you can't the have only, it both ways. And he really tries. Like, the only way that you could make that work is to abandon the main thing that, uh, that he no made himself known for, which is you would have to accept the worst form of actually existing socialism as a possibility. Right. You know, sure, socialism is inevitable, but it also might be barbaric. <laughs> right. Well, not in a cool or degist way. Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> Bordegas are what is like socialism or barbarism. Why not both? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, all right. Uh, for political theory is, in terms of what it opposes now, clear. It opposes liberalism. It is neither fascism, nor communism, nor liberalism. Uh, it is also not third-way politics, communization theory, or all the other stuff that claims to be not the fascism, nor communism, nor liberalism. What about MAGA communism? Is it that? Uh, well, as this is... Dugan's softness to national Bolshevism actually sort of fucks with me because I can only justify it cynically. I can't justify it in everything else he says. Um, and why would I be cynical about it? Because national Bolshevism would be breaking the West up from a Dasein of the West into chunks of nations, which would be easier to oppose. Right. Um, Whereas the Rushki Mir or the, you know, the Islamic world and the Chinese world, he's okay with those places being coherent because he doesn't really see them as a threat. Um, but like the Atlanticist world, that can't coexist with the other worlds for him. Um, so, so, you know, I can only read that cynically, but maybe, maybe people, uh, and I also realize I need to read more Carl Schmidt, even though I don't like every time I read Carl Schmidt, I don't understand why leftists love him so much because I'm just like, he's clearly a fucking Nazi. Um, but whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, the fourth nomos of the earth stuff, apparently we need to understand because it's also tied into the fourth position. Um, Carl Schmidt's fourth nomos of the earth. See, I, I hadn't heard of that before. Man. What's a nomos? <laughs> Oh, nomos. Uh, I knew that from philosophy. Uh, all right, nomos. Let me remind myself what it is. Um, uh, and to put you on the spot, it means essential order, according to the internet. Yeah, well, a nomos, I believe, I'm trying to remember what it, an essential order, but that can sound like a, a like a, like a Dasein, right? But it's, I think it's like natural law. No, that's logos. So that's what I'm trying to figure out what the distinction is here. Um, um, let's see here. Polit it's related to political theology, and I always remember have to remember myself what it is. Uh, I know that it's fourth nomos as opposed to constitutionalism. Like fundamentally. Um, so I guess nomos would be like social order. Mm. Um, uh, so. Is the fourth social um, order also the third Reich? For Schmidt? No, because he wrote this in the 50s. Okay. All right. So this is after he's given that up. 
Um, so no, okay. Uh, Nomos is 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 kind of a root related to uh, Oikos or Oko, Okonomia, home. which is like like home or order of the home. So, so Nomos of the Earth would be like uh, the way you would define um, who has a home where. Mm. Okay, that was like I was like that's I was like I'm remembering that being a weird particular use of nomos. Um, so it's an ordering, the fourth yeah. ordering of the earth, like national ordering. Yes, or civilizational ordering, maybe civilizational ordering, probably because he's probably moving away from national at that point. Um, and for the, any Smith specialist who wants to like come in and comment about why I'm being mean to him or how I misrepresented him. Uh, I definitely welcome the latter. The first one, I don't give a shit. It was a Nazi. All, All right. Um, magazine stands. Sound off in the comments. Right. <laughs> um, we a lot of right wingers apparently watch this. It's actually somewhat weird. Oh, that's flattering, I suppose. And it's yeah, right? it was actually funny because some of them were like, "I think this is fair," and I'm like, "I don't know that I like that you think it's fair." <laughs> <laughs> Chalk one down for fairness. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right um danger of reading things fairly i guess <laughs> yeah um so okay so we we have we have the reestablishment of what we established in the first chapter for political theory is neither liberalism communism or fascism although took 45 minutes yeah <laughs> um I mean, he took three pages in a not very long chapter redefining it again. So, <laughs> to be fair to us, um, uh, but it—it's interesting um, what he thinks it is. I mean, one of the things I keep on struggling with with him is like he's like, "This is a no to fascism." He keeps on saying that, but he also the framework is explicitly post-fascist. You can't, you have to know fascist theory for this to even be coherent. Like, right. Um, I mean, I think a big that, problem is that this mm -hmm. suffers from a total lack of an economic analysis. It's just a philosophical position. So like, sure, it's, it's post-fascist, but it's still only either capitalist or communist. So it's either liberal or fascist or communist still. Right. Well, I mean, and and we would argue that what makes fascism weird is like fascism is liberal in some of its economic policies, attempts to be communistic, uh, not communist, but communistic in others, right? And uh, tries to like tie syndicalism and and welfareism and all that into a capitalist politics that also claims to be rejecting capital, but still needs to be capitally productive. Yeah. Um, well, and communism does that a lot too, honestly. Yeah, I know. I mean, the, the thing is like the thing about fascism is fascism actually is delivering, although failing to be coherent or successful at, but actually doing what it says it's going to do communists right. always put off us doing what we're saying we're going to do further and further into the future yeah communists were always like i'm setting it up and eventually it's going to be great and we yeah. just never we never get to start we're always stuck right before we begin and I, I do like to point out for all the people who like to quote midwestern marx style that thing about Engels and and a development and they always bracket out the part where he says that like we have the developmental capacity in 1880 in Germany to have communism. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's just, I'm like, guys, <laughs> I don't know what you think you need, but uh, well, I mean, that's the basis of the term late capitalism. The, the right. whole idea is that like the reason why it's late is because it's a, uh, it's like withering on the vine. It's not late because it's been a while, like in some just, it's not just in terms of the amount of time. It's also in terms of the amount of time it needed to have been developing. Right. So the, the idea that you have to develop into the 20th century and beyond is nonsense. It's, it's already nonsense. Even according to, you know, the first generation of the big beards. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have to remind ourselves who came up with the term late capitalism, although he ended up being a Nazi. Um, uh, Werner Sombart, not Mandel. Oh, that's, is that, that's right. Yeah. 
Werner Sumbart was talking about late capitalism in like 1910. Like it's well, and to his credit, he was right. <laughs> and and one of the ways, the other ways that it could be like Marxified too, of course, is uh, what left communist theory does with it, uh, with the conception of decadence theory, right? So that too is like a withering. So in 1914 or whatever, uh, maybe it's the 1970s, right. what I would consider is like the full flourishing and like the progressive aspect of capital. And now it's not just late to bloom, but it's actually withering upon the tree, but done with like, you know, value theory and done with, uh, yeah, in a in well, less yeah. mystic sort of way. It's like postmodernism and post-industrial and whatever. Those terms are valuable only if you recognize that all they really mean is it's modernism, but like it's like zombie modernism and zombie industrialism. It's not right. po it's not post in the in the literal definition of the term. It's only post in the sense that to call it zombie is a uh, I don't know too uncomfortable for people. I guess. Mm. Yeah, I mean, but the, you know, to get where Dugan can have can have a certain persuasion where you know maybe i was just reading alex hochili's like breakdown of the, the of the uh the millennial left um which i'm going to do a series of shows on i have no idea whether they'll come out before or after this does sorry people um but uh that i was thinking about it when i was reading this it's just like well okay so one of the weird things about everyone giving up on all the weird like horizontalism of of uh, in the in the developed world of like the 90s aughts and aught and early pre i'd say 2014 uh um late gen x or early millennial left um is that uh we've been trying to just rebuild like I keep on hearing people talk about this mass industrial work uh, proletariat. And when they, when they realize it doesn't exist, they try to put it in a third world or someplace far away from them. And I hate to tell them it doesn't actually really exist there either. Mm, right. Like in no place on earth is the, is like industrial workers, the majority of the population. Right. Um, and, 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 yeah, and, yeah. and even the mass worker isn't the mass worker of the, steel mills of Pittsburgh or Detroit in the 1950s, even in, in like the bleeding edge of the last 30 years of capitalist industrial development, and like the Pearl River Delta, it was actually still a very decentralized and nimble and movable and uh, 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 less mass worker industrialization than we saw a hundred and something years ago in the United States. Right. A lot of small shops. I mean, that's why it happens in South China because there's this long history of like relatively decentralized production in small shops. This is why in the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, that becomes the site of large scale um, Chinese industrial development against the mass worker North, right? The old right. Soviet developmental model. So already like the, the quote unquote third world or develop, developing capitalist world is like reproducing the same fragmentation of the mass worker that's happening in the West at the same time. The reason why I bring it up, though, is that this is a point of view for like we we complain and Dugan has no political economy. He absolutely doesn't. He, yeah. he would also go like, and I don't need it. Dasein's on my side. Like, right. right. Um, I, I'm with, I'm with Jason on this. Like you were saying in the last episode that I listened to, the fact that there's no underlying like even mechanics to history that it's a series of like free floating ideas, maybe with some events like a 9/11 thrown in, is like right. a maddening way to read history. It, it just it drives me kind of nuts, but it's fascinating on its own terms. I'm like, how the fuck are these just like broad philosophical idealist positions justifiable by? It? He has some vision of totality, but it's like an idea. It's like um, uh, it's it's the totality of post liberalism, right? Yeah, it's it's well, also right. it's also a Dasein. You can will it. Right? Yeah, like, like I, I I think that the fourth political theory, the stuff that he's outlining would be more valuable as either a sublated liberalism or fascism or socialism because right. it would be because it would be a, a clear understanding of things that have happened and taking all of that into account but still situating it within what needs to actually be well the mega the mega communist crypto duganist however can be like well we have stalinist uh um political economy 
although they don't really agree on what it is, it's like a mixture of stuff from 1931 during third periodism mixed with stuff from 1952 during Stalin's own like last economic testament, which is actually flirtation with liberalizing. <laughs> um, uh, and then they have dung and, you know, it's, it's like a melange of incoherent Marxist Leninisms from different time periods kind of squished together and distilled into a mess. However, what they're doing is they're taking the geopolitics of this relatively idealist but decoupled framework with a civilizational politics and then like, well, you know, we can just fill in the gaps with uh, Stalinism. And I don't know. I mean, like, Dugan's not saying we can't. I mean, actually, he is saying you can. You can't. But he doesn't care if he can convince people to do it. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's interesting to me where this leads because I think I think you're right. There's no political economy here. but if your choices are nebulous, structuralist, leaderless, no, totally voluntaristic post-Marxism slash anarchism of the 1990s, and let's pretend we can either do 1920s Bolshevism or 1930s social democracy again. I don't know. This actually is kind of compelling because those other two things clearly didn't fucking work right. and their political economy failed why the hell are you just trying to will them back into being right plus you can make the argument i wouldn't that something like uh a, a real movement pre presently in existence uh is, is is more dungest right than it is anything else because if you've seen any anything of the last 50 years any great leaps in the human endeavor it has happened through like uh, a, a, a single party communist state using free market methods. Yeah, although right. we are now hitting the real limits of that. Yeah. Ironically, now that everyone believes it in the West. Yeah. Uh, it's like you and me, you and me, Varn, have been on that have been on that that kick for like over a year now, right? Yeah. It's just like, okay, guys, your your recognition is late and wrong. Like yeah. because because it's late. Like yeah. um but, always <laughs> um it's like you know, maybe you guys should have been nicer to to Jimin and Hu Jintao, and maybe like who's that? Not, I'm not sure that those people even fit in at all. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, so anyway, so we have uh, dismembered into components. They lose their significance and become meaningless. There is a sense of a truly weirdly both conservative yet postmodern glee. I think Matt McManus might be actually a little bit right about postmodernism or post-structuralism postmodernism really isn't a thing but post-structuralism's like conservative character in here because there very much is when there's no rules we can bring the old rules back like that's basically actually, actually the moment when all rules dissolve mm -hmm. that like a rule can actually appear for the first time reappear for the first time right right, right. now this is interesting because we have to get into the design again um, because Dasein is about the individual, but Dugan's actually going to make it clear the difference between liberal individualism and Dasein individualism. All right, uh, so I'm going to get into this. In liberal ideology, the historical subject is the individual. We've all talked about this. Uh, this is me talking. We've been talking about this for forever. I actually agree with Dugan that at this point, that's the only part of liberalism left that's agreed upon. Ironically, that's also Francis Fukuyama's assertion. Um, mm -hmm that all that's left of liberalism now is a hollowed out atomistic individualism. Every other part of it has kind of had to be abandoned due to its contradictions with that. Um, the individual is conceived as a unit that is rational and endowed with will. The individual is both given is both a given and the goal of liberalism. Yeah. It is a given, but one that is un aware of its identity as an individual. All forms of collective identity, ethnic, national, religious, caste, and so on, you'll notice caste being in there being interesting, impede on an individual's awareness of his individuality. Liberalism encourages the individual to become himself, that is, to be free of all those social identities and dependencies that constrain and define the individual from the outside. Uh, asterisk. This is also the difference between liberal individualism and Christian personalism. An asterisk. Um, uh, Christian personalism requires actually roles and dependencies that you have to have. 
Um, this this is a meaning of liberalism in English, liberty, and Latin, libertas. The call to become liberated, Latin, liber, from all things external to oneself. Moreover, liberal theorists, in particular John Stuart Mill, underscored the fact that we are talking about a freedom from about a release from ties, identifications, and restrictions that, that are an imposition upon the individual's will. This is also, you know, Isaiah Berlin talks about this, like, John Stuart Mill basically makes negative liberty the only thing you really have. Um, as for what purpose of this freedom is, liberals remain silent. To assert some kind of normative goal is, in their eyes, to restrict the individual and his freedom. I mean, sometimes utilitarians don't have a problem with that. Dugan, but whatever. Uh, therefore, they strictly separate a freedom from, which they regard as a moral imperative of social development, from a freedom for the normativization of how, why, and what the purpose of freedom should be used. The latter remains at the discretion of the historical subject, in other words, the individual. The historical subject of the second political theory is class. I feel like he's repeating stuff, but whatever. <laughs> um, the, the class structure of society and the conflict between the exploiter and the exploited classes are the core of the communist dramatic vision of history. History is class struggle. Politics is its expression. The proletariat is a dialectical historical subject, which is called to set itself free from the, dom from the domination of the bourgeoisie and to build a new society on uh, a society on new foundations. A single individual is, is conceived here as part of a class-based whole. Uh, and acquire social existence only in the process of raising class consciousness. That's not that latter is, I think, is not true. I think I was with his description of Marxism until that latter bit. That I think what what he, what he's doing is he's describing the deficient uh, vulgar Marxism that he was raised with, mm -hmm. and like it's it's probably it, there's very little value that can come from this, but it's it's interesting to me to try to imagine Dugan in the West. If he if he was raised in the West, but he was the same personality, because I think he would just be a a Marxist, or he would consider himself to be a Marxist, anyways. Yeah, I think I think he's he's uh, that last sentence there. A single individual is conceived here as part of a class based whole and acquires social existence only in the process of raising class consciousness. I think that is like a very visceral callback to his youth and like what it meant to be a Soviet citizen. Right? Yeah. Like a Soviet citizen is one who uh, does the rituals of, believes in, uh, cheers for the correct version of uh, class consciousness. Um, right. So um, I, I don't think he's he's talking about this in a theoretical sense. I think for a very real, in a very real way for him, you know, this is what it meant. This is what he yeah, saw. Yeah, yeah. I think but, that's but, right. And the state telling this from people. Right. Although it's interesting to think about this in terms of what Marx says, because Marx makes it point that part of the goal is to get rid of classes altogether. Right. Class consciousness is to turn class, the class in itself to the class for itself, because in doing so, it will hopefully fight to abolish class because to get out of that binds the only way it could, the only way the proletariat could do so. Yeah. Um, and in held to constantly to, to self abolish. Right. And I mean, you know, that's the whole communization critique of classical communism, right? Depending on why you think it did it, depends on what kind of communization theorist you are. But it's like, well, the class never actually takes the gambit to abolish itself. And you know, the you know, the classical Marxists can go because we've never got that far. Right. But right. <laughs> um, one thing that one thing about that also though is that that actually makes uh Dasein as subject. Uh, more immediately relevant to Marxist discourse. Well, I think that's yeah. In what sense? I think that's why uh, I think that's why Marcuse fucked with it. Well, oh. Marcuse. I mean, we got to remember Marcuse tried to incorporate Heidegger into like critical theory Marxism, right? Uh, yeah. uh, like almost to piss off Adorno. I think people forget that like Marcuse liked Heidegger. Adorno Adorno hated Heidegger. So like. Um, and the one dimensional man for all that I think it's kind of not a great book um, is an attempt to tie the two together. Right. Yeah. Um, I need to reread that because I haven't read it in like 20 years. So I, I don't, I barely remember it except for the, like the, the spark notes version. Yeah. And I, I don't know if I would, could recount what it actually says. And then we get the, the subject again. I just wanted to read that thing about, 
about what he thought the process was because he hadn't said it before. And finally, the subject of the third political theory is either the state uh, or a race. In fascism, everything is based upon a right-wing version of Hegelianism, since Hegel himself considered him a Prussian state to be the peak of historical development, and the subjective spirit was perfected. Uh, that's also vulgar Marxist interpretations of Hegel. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I don't think I would miss. I would not agree with that. I would not state that on my own. Mm. But I would. I would need to back. I would need to spend some time preparing my arguments in order to debate that. I have gone back and forth to whether or not I think the philosophy of right actually implies that. People argue with me about it, and then I then I listen to them, then I read it, and I feel like maybe it doesn't. Then I read it again and feel like maybe it does. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm the not, same way. Like, like if I'm arguing with somebody, then I think it doesn't. But if I'm right. not arguing with somebody, then I think, oh, maybe it does. Right. <laughs> so I don't know if that says a, a little bit about me and like what I wish it said, but you know. I do, I do think it's interesting. I mean, he t he finally goes into more here, like for Giovanni Gentile, the the a proponent of Hegelianism and kind of a particular, I mean, fascist Hegelianism specifically. But G Gentile was a Hegelian, was even praised by Lenin for it before he became a fascist. Um, I think people often don't know that, but I think I think all serious thinkers, for mm -hmm. at least for the twentieth century, or at least. Heavily influenced by Hegel, if not consciously Hegelian themselves. Yeah, and this includes actually the analytics who were rebelling against Hegel because what were they were doing? They were responding to Hegel. Like right. Well, that's why Foucault said, you know, however much we can fight Hegel and we think we get away from him, if we go for, far enough, we'll find Hegel waiting for us on the other side. <laughs> Hegel's always there, just hiding in the shadows, waiting to get you. All right. Um, but you know, um, for Gentile, the state itself is actually the subject. Right. All right. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. National socialism. Okay. Now, I will say this is where I started getting a little bit annoyed. I mean, we just read it. We're now almost an hour in. Uh oh. Are you being raided, Ben? Apparently. Uh, yeah. Where, is that, that's on your end, right? Yeah, yeah. That's on my end. Um, uh, I live by a military base. I think uh, um, uh, when I live in Los Angeles, I would hear helicopters like every day, but I didn't live anywhere near a helicopter pad. Ghetto birds, man. Yeah. But I just wanted to say that we've spent an hour going back over this because this is also a good portion of the chapter is, is Dugan restating his argument. And we cannot, we cannot accuse him of not being thorough. Right. But maybe we can accuse him of being slightly redundant. Yeah. Although what I will say is every time he makes this argument, he gives you more of it. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, honestly, like I kind of think this is an example of, of Dugan being a, a faithful Hegelian because what he's doing is he he's makes the argument and he goes back through the argument again mm -hmm. in different terms and it makes it more clear. And when you get to the end, you realize, oh, that's just what I already read before. But now I actually understand what I read before. Yeah. Didactic like Stalin. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> That would be funny if Dugan's accidentally a faithful Hegelian because he was fed so much Hegelianized uh, Hegelian Stalinism as a as as a youth that he doesn't know another way to structure an argument. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, in a way, that's actually a, that would actually be a a uh, bit of it. <laughs> well, and it would it be a very um, I don't know what to call it. It would say a lot about the Soviet education system and also the cunning of reason. Like, okay, <laughs> the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore, and yet, and yet it kind of does because, because this exists. Um, he does say the consequences of uh, Nazi racialism were appalling. Appalling consequences of this ideology are too well known to dwell upon them. It's interesting, yeah. though. You know, who else, you know who else said that? Sam Francis. You guys know who Sam Francis is? No. You don't. Um, he was a compaleo conservative racial nationalist. He was the first person to get kicked out of the National Review for being a crypto Nazi. Uh, followed later by Joe Stobren and then like it, uh, John Derbyshire much, much later, if you know the various purgings for being too much of a right nationalist. Um, you got a tacky MAGA. Yeah. I mean, and these, yeah. 
talking mad guys, people who pro, pro, these are the people who were a coterie of like the dark powers behind Pat Buchanan. Oh. Um, and I read them back in the day. I mean, when I was in the when I was on the right, like in, in early uh, aughts, uh, those people were kind of de rigueur, and and they had a whiff of of uh, rebellion against them, and they were anti-war. Right. Uh, although San Francis was dead, um, but Francis San Francis actually says a similar thing in his Leviathan and its Enemies, where he's basically arguing that we need. We need a, <laughs> We need a PMC class to fight the PMC class. He doesn't use those terms because it wasn't developed yet. All right. Actually, it was developed yet, but people had dropped it and hadn't picked it back up. But uh, we needed like a we needed a meaner managerial class to fight the managerial class. Uh, and it needed to be like racial nationalism, but racial nationalism would be too horrific in the stakes to actually impose. So we just needed a ethno identity to substitute for it. Um, in a sense, he cut kind of, Dugan kind of argues the same thing a little bit later in this chapter. Yeah, I mean, what when you when you read this, you're like, I hate to say it, but like that shift that people like miss between the between the dumb alt right, explicit white nationalist, and the cultural chauvinist, that's all predicted 10, 20 years before. That was actually like almost a pattern that they knew was going to have to happen. Hmm. Yeah. Um. All right. Uh, all right. The definition of a historical subject is a is a fundamental political ba a fundamental basis for a political ideology in general and defines a structure. Therefore, in this matter, the fourth political subject may act in the most radical way by rejecting all of these constructions as candidates for the historical subject. Mm -hmm. My uh, uh, friend of the show, Colin Drum, who also thinks we should throw out all historical subjects uh, and only have like an idea of progressive sovereignty. And like a progressive Hobbesianism uh, for survival with no account for freedom is his answer. And, you know, I think people say that's left wing, I guess. I don't I know. Mean, what it, kind of, it, it kind of is, but that's actually less clear than Dasein as the new subject. Yeah, I know. Well, but you know, he's not, the historical subject is neither an individual nor a class nor the state nor race. This is the anthropological and historical axiom of the four political theory. So we know what it's not. We finally got to that. No, right. it's not. Um, we assume that it can be clear to us who or what cannot be the historical subject. And finally, Dugan asks, but who or what can? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, who or what can? You've taken out most everything. But we uh, clear the space and correctly pose the question, right? You have to pose it correctly. You can't yeah. let the dead weight of history and all these other historical subjects cloud your vision. Right. Yeah, and there's a certain amount of, of, of nod to him that I want to give. However much it's been a very annoying. It's like, okay, <laughs> at least you did it. You know? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know what's funny? I know maybe this will be more controversial on your show, Sean. Yeah. But does this do, having read a history of separation many, many times now by in notes, I'm like, in some ways it rhymes with this. Oh yeah. Um <laughs> like um like except our Dasein is the commune like, <laughs> um well i hope my people aren't too offended by that no but i, I wonder how your audience is gonna be like <laughs> communization duganism roughly the same thing um, no, this um, is the era this we're in a, a hundred flowers bloom period of syncretization so maybe someone can get communization duganism off the ground who knows i i Someone, someone can. It Sean, just political someone on. will. It okay. won't. Be me. No, don't say it's going to be me. No, I'm not saying it's you. Okay. You're not. <laughs> I dodged the bullet. <laughs> Your heel turned. You were a secret hide of Gary the whole time, yeah. uh, <laughs> without even knowing what the sign is. <laughs> um. No. I, I. No. I just. I feel like. You know what I think that might have been. You remember the Ultracom guys. I don't know. Do I? Those are the people who thought like communization was the riot, like literally, and some of them became. Popular. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, I kind of think maybe they are like for political communizers. Why isn't Dugan picking up on them, man? <laughs> he might no. be. We don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, Yeah. Dugan might just be a little bit too uh, clever 
and a little bit too good at uh, public relations to say it outright. <laughs> and he might not read enough anarchistnews.com. Oh, yeah. I mean, this that's definitely also true. <laughs> um, I mean, I can tell you who tried to do something just like that. Troy Southgate. Mm. Uh, Bay, uh, Bay Area N National Anarchist. In the National oh, Anarchist. yes. I remember that. They got their asses beat a whole bunch just yep. by but they, but they, I mean, but the thing is, they were just a little bit too early. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, they've only been on Twitter today. Like, oh, God, yeah, they would, they would make a killing. Um, like a communitarian ethnic chaz. You could see it. You could totally see it. Not only can you see it, I think it's kind of hap like the, that kind of happened on the left in weird ways. Like in the nineties, there was this weird, like Cascadian region, bio regional nationalist movements that would be like, well, you know, we want to have a left Cascadia and it's going to be like, you know, super commie and modern and stuff, maybe a little bit primitivist. Uh, but I'm, that, I guess that means we have to be okay with needing Confederates. <laughs> like there are still vague echoes of that all up and down the, the West coast too. Like if you, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. when you get into Portland and Seattle and mm -mm. Olympia and whatever, You'll still there's still some of that. You'll encounter it like as oh, I've, as yeah. as an affectation. It's not a serious political movement anymore, but it's definitely still there. It's still like cultural communitarianism, basically. Yeah, yeah. I have met people who are like, I'm a bio, I'm a bio regional anarchist, and I'm like, that okay, like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, that also might be your candidate for for Dugan communization theory. Actually, all right. Um, so we're building this into existence we got to be careful oh yeah it's just like i, I might be telling people who they actually are like, yeah. <laughs> all right um this, okay this is what we get for heading into the depths of this void yeah, the, boundless, the boundless and bottomless seas um all right so the oh, yeah. first hypothesis suggests abandoning all types of kindredness of the role of historical subject from the classical political theory Assuming that the subject of foreign political theory is some type of compound, not the individual, class, state, race, or nation on their own, but instead a certain combination thereof. This is the hypothesis of a compound subject. That's interesting. So this is maybe this is the first this is the first indication of why he might think national Bolshevism is acceptable. Is it cynical? Yeah, because um, national Bolshevism is a compound subject. It is. It's like, class and state, right? Yeah, it's class. Right. It's class. And, it's class and ethnos, if not race, right? Um, the second hypothesis is that we approach the problem from from the standpoint of phenomenology. Let us, but we're not using Hegelian phenomenology. We're using Husserl's phenomenology. Oh, another philosopher. Yep, it's fucking Sean's day up. Yeah, um, I, I was up early this morning swinging a hammer, man. <laughs> Earl. Give us the spark notes. <laughs> yeah. All you need to know about Husserl is that um, you just need to know Sartre instead. Yeah. Husserl is like Sartre, our, our Heidegger light. Kind of. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, although he does. Yeah. Of Epo e e Poche. E e yeah. E e Epoche or Epoche. Yeah. Um, which is basically where you get this idea of life world. So it's a gestalt, right? Um, is it a habitas? Uh, I think it, I think a habitas would be part of a life world, but it's also like it would incorporate political economy, habitas, ideology, metaphysics. They're all kind of together. It's a big, um, you you know what it would be close to, like um, epistemes in Foucault. Okay. Um, uh, so if you because Foucault takes that Althusserian structuralism and kind of adds this stuff back into it, mm -hmm. like, um, so so we take the epuche, uh, the epoke, um, the life world of the political one free from metaphysics and theology. Is it possible to consider political history without without a subject history as such? Mm -hmm. After all, theoretically. There were historical periods where po when politics existed, but when there was no subject in the philosophical Cartesian sense. Hmm. I mean, yeah, but uh, I mean, also maybe no. The Marxist because the Marxist answer would be like, just because you didn't have a name for it didn't mean it didn't exist. Yeah. Um, 
But anyway, of course, in hindsight, even in this pre-subject political history was reinterpreted in accordance to various ideologies. But we no longer trust ideologies. This is this is an old conservative thing. We are non-ideological. Everybody else is ideological. We don't right. trust ideologies, which for Marxists is like, aha, that is that is like the ultimate admission of having an ideology. Because right, yeah, yeah, yeah. natural law is non-ideological. Right. Yeah. Right. Actually, that's probably a, a larger part of why Dugan was is regarded as a fascist on the left mm -hmm. because because of that. Right. Because he's a he's like a very classical, I mean, a very typical conservative for his time, but a uh, more intelligent, which means he's a fascist. Right. Um. Okay. I said. I said. I think I said that. Uh. The that uh, world system theory came from the regulation school. It also comes from the NL school. That's from Brunel. Mm -hmm. That's from. Okay. I got. I got my, my French schools of of historiography confused for a second. Sorry, guys. Regulation um, school is a, a post war, and a null school really comes. Oh no, they're they're both post war. Post -war. They're both post war, and they're in dialogue with each other. But they're not. Yeah, they're fifties, like more fifties, and then regulation schools more sixties and seventies. Right. They overlap with each other. All right. If we consider the hit political history in the style of the Annals school, so now we have the return to why uh, Wallerstein was mentioned earlier, even though he's not pointing that out. A connection, uh, yeah. Yeah. Then we have a chance to discover a rather poly, uh, polyphonic picture expanding our understanding of the subject. In the spirit of Peter Berger, we can open up the prospect of desecularization. Uh oh. Mm -mm. Throughout history, religious organizations frequently act as political subjects, or together with Carl Smith, we can think of the influence of tradition on political decision in the spirit of Smith's doctrine of decisionism. Discarding the dogma of progress will reveal an array of political actors opening up until and beyond the new age, which fits into a conservative approach. But we are free to continue our open search for what may replace the historical subject of the future. Perhaps in this exotic hypothesis of Deleuze and Qatari about the rhizome, a body also without organs. Another, another aughts reference that was very, yeah. very hot at the time. Yep. This, I was about to say this was hotter when this, was, when this came out. Yeah, uh, a body without organs, a micro politics, and so on are the horizon of of, of proto history with Baudrillard and Derrida, text deconstruction, difference, etc. This office is a new and this time not entirely conservative capabilities. You know, to to episode to uh, bring up our social democratic friend whose politics I sometimes find milk toast, but I like him as a person. He's read about this. It shows you that there's a certain postmodern edge to most conservative thought post 1980 mm. um that even though postmodernism was not did not present itself as conservative at all uh that it's 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 total abandoning of even a chosen teleology right yeah. um means that uh there's a sense in which history is utterly the same. And in some ways, what's more conservative than that? All right. Let's get through these hypotheses. So, so we got through hypotheses too. And that last bit, he's like, well, you know, postmodern leftists aren't so bad. Um, <laughs> Baudrillard and Derrida, we like them. Mm. Um, and he literally says it. I mean, here's what he says. They offer us a new, and this time, not entirely conservative capabilities. Therefore, it is not worthwhile to reject them in advance. <laughs> Simply because they author sympathies towards Marxism and their leftist affiliation. All right. As James Lindsay or Jordan Peterson might. Yep. Right. Um, the third hypothesis is about forcing the, phenomenal the phenomenological method and rushing several steps ahead. So we go from Herschel to Heidegger real fast. Yep. Um, it's like the Matrix. Uh, yep. Um, we may propose to consider Heidegger's Dasein. I mean, you only put it as the head of the chapter, so we, we knew we had to get there eventually. <laughs> as the subject of fourth political theory. So, you know what? We're going to, you know, Dugan says we're going to out Heidegger, Heidegger. That's what we're going to do. We're going to have a compound subject. What is that compound subject? Being itself. Um, compound being... everything. <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. You about to say something? Oh no, I think I was just laughing. Yeah. Um, 
Dasein is described in Heidegger's philosophy at length through its existential structure, which makes it possible to build a complex holistic model based on it and development of which would lead to, for instance, a new understanding of politics. Many researchers have lost sight of the fact that Heidegger, especially in his middle period between 1936 and 1945, the period no one wants to talk about. It's blue period. <laughs> Imagine that many researchers have lost sight of, of Heidegger during his Nazi years. <laughs> <laughs> you will notice that uh, Duke doesn't remind you of that. that no, it's, years. It's, dates. it's dates, it's a, a nine year period. The nine just, year period that's just the middle period, you know, <laughs> the middle period that happened to be fucking World War II. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, develop- everybody was on vacation, you know, <laughs> yeah. Developed a complete history of philosophy centered around Dasein, which it has become apparent in retrospect can form the basis of a full fledged and well developed political philosophy. All right. Only in retrospect, apparently, apparently during 1936 to 1945, it was inapplicable. Yeah. So, you know, Nazi Heidegger, he didn't understand his own theory yet, but that's when he developed it. <laughs> like... <laughs> and we in the past can revindicate him, you know? Mm-hmm. What he was actually about. Well, you know what they say about the Owl of Minerva. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Lies a lot on this podcast series. <laughs> yes. Thus, accepting the Don the Dasein hypothesis, I've never heard Dasein posited as a hypothesis before, but okay. Immediately gives us a broad map in order to navigate the construction of history necessary for a political theory. If the subject is Dasein, then the four political theory would constitute a fundamental ontological structure. That is the basis that is developed on the basis of existential anthropology. Dun dun dun. Now we get some bullet points, baby. Yeah, now, bullet points. now we can map out the direction of the type of approach. Dasein in the state, Dasein in social stratification. We are not having a class of society, you goons. Mm-hmm. Dasein and power, the will to power. Oh, we got our Nietzsche back. All right. <laughs> uh, being in politics. That sounds like that could have been a. A lame Badu book. <laughs> anyway, um, the horizons of political temporality. That also sounds like it could be uh, any number of people's books. Existential spatiality and the phenomenology of boundaries. That just yeah. sounds like a, a name of a paper. Yeah, yeah it's, it sounds so, like. Uh, is he talking about borders there? Is he literally talking? Yeah, about he's talking about borders, borders and how they might move phenomenologically, perhaps over the. <laughs> Over the border, the yeah. east, perhaps a general plan to the east to move yeah. our phenomenology of boundaries. <laughs> yeah. Um, the prince and nothing. I that one I don't understand. I was like, okay, so Machiavelli and nihilism. Um, yeah, what, what is he doing there? What, what is the point of that? Yeah, I don't care. Machiavelli is he using nothing in the terms in like terms of like Heidegger's nihilism? Like, Maybe I don't know. I mean, like, it's a bullet point, we're not given any explanation. <laughs> We're supposed to be mapping this onto our like graph paper, right? Yeah, I like don't know what the x and y ma- axes are, but <laughs> this is this is an example of me actually really wanting to understand something, and but there's no yeah. there are no tools for it. There, yeah. there's no further understanding that can be gleaned from this. No, it's I feel like it's not so far. It's like all all six uh, volumes of Capital right here. Yeah, <laughs> Parliament, the choice and being towards death. Whoa, okay. That's some 1939 vibes right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, citizenship and the role of guardians of being. So, well, okay. middle period vibes, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Middle period. Guardians of being sounds like a Marvel movie. <laughs> well, you know what that is? That's, uh, that is, I'm taking Heideggerian phenomenology and applying the Republic of Plato to it. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's not Starship Troopers. Well, I mean, it might be, but. It's Starship Troopers with more Heidegger. <laughs> um, you know everything you think you know, but with more Heidegger. <laughs> um, referendum and intentionality, the authentic and inauthentic in jurisprudence. Okay, so that's Heidegger and Smith together. That's yeah. what that is. Yeah. Um, I, I hate to say it, but a lot of this seems like Nazi stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not. I'm, I'm really not accusing him of being just Nazi. I don't think that's true. But I am sure. Well, no. Like... I, I I just think it would be more. It'd be easier and better and uh more clear if he would just say, "This is the the 
to the contours of the philosophy of national socialism, but minus the racialist aspect which destroyed national socialism. Yeah, what, this, is, what is salvageable from fascism? Yeah, that would be so much simpler. That was the Sam Francis. Yeah, argument. it was actually. Except yeah. that he was probably a libertarian in a way, though, right? Well, no, Sam Francis was not. Was he a Catholic integralist? No, he was a he was a Protestant racialist. Okay. Uh, but he didn't think racialism was viable, so like... So he's an old-school racialist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of, actually, yeah. He was a, like a, an American 19th century uh, scientist. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. It was an H.P. Lovecraft type. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, more, more, no, H.P. Lovecraft is a biological racialist, so this is the pre gerbanau type of... Because... Yeah. It's hard to talk about like racialism in the early republic because we clearly had it and there were some clearly nascent biological notions of it. But there's also a lot of founding fathers who believe like, no, we're just superior because of our culture. But if they adopted our culture, they would become white like us, probably even literally. That was um, interesting, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's why uh, Dugan later on, what he, he calls liberalism, like the foundation of all racist assumptions, because he's like, our understanding of progress as a thing that, you know, darker colored people need to adopt mm -hmm. is the way in which people develop racial ideologies because progress and liberalism, they go hand in hand and thus they create racism. And he makes a good argument for it, actually. Yeah, actually, interestingly, he kind of actually agrees with Abraham X. Kendi. <laughs> <laughs> put another... Put another next to a famous figure who can be synthesized with Duganus. <laughs> Duganus ex kidneyist? <laughs> What's Sorry. weird is that like because Dugan is very smart in the way he you know presents all this stuff, he kind of sets himself up to actually be uh, a very important philosopher because he actually does represent a synthesis of a whole lot of philosophers, a whole whole lot of people. Yeah. And if he was not writing in Russian and published by a Nazi sympathetic publishing house from India, um, right. he might have been that. I mean, you can see why Mark Millerman, despite whatever his politics is, would have been attracted to this. Yeah. Particularly from the from the time period we're talking about, like the, the late aughts. Like, um, it makes me wonder how like the infrareds of the world read this section. Like are they are they attempting to graft um, like dungist Marxism yeah. onto this mental yeah th th this this project because I I'm not sure yeah they are I mean they are and they can they can that's why they but they keep on like they, that's why they play weird games about who who the subject is like it's not blue hairs who work at Starbucks but it is petite bourgeois Koreans who shoot people during the LA riots. And it's not it's um boy people, obviously. <laughs> um and it's not uh and and the the whole world's already socialist because capitalism's already collapsed, kind of. Um that's another theory they that's have. Standard, the Yehu theory, right? Yep. Um uh which by the way, uh this, this is why our friend uh, Stefan Hamill makes me a little bit uncomfortable when he talks about capitalism already being dead because I'm like, there's already people who believe that and uh, they're scary. Um, right. Because <laughs> they also try to convince me that we live in socialism right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Just, I mean, talk well, about we live Mark Hegel. <laughs> like, we live in socialism minus uh, the last feature which would illustrate and illuminate all the other pre-existing features. So because the because the bourgeoisie the bourgeoisie still exists all of the parts of socialism are not yet apparent but once we get rid of the bourgeoisie all that work is already done for us it's it's I, nonsense but it's it's i can it, see how you it, get there's there, a certain actually. reason yeah exactly yeah um okay so the fourth hypothesis uh appeals to the concept of imagination okay now we get into stuff that's like we don't normally come up with in left subjects um la imaginaire uh, you might go on, why is it got french there and that's because we're referring to a frenchman gilbert doron uh, the topics that cover new public works of i think gilbert doron all right french people you can correct my obviously awful and over pronunciation gilbert uh, gilbert doron thank you actually that's probably right yeah yeah 
in French restaurants for a long time. So thank Unless you, Bert. Back to Nui talk all the time. Uh, the basic ideas of which I discuss in my new work, the, the sociology of imagination, which we don't have, and I don't believe has been translated into English. <laughs> um, imagination as a structure precedes the individual, the collective, the class, the culture, and race. Bam! Young. Carl That's Young. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, aha! He, he does qualify that, though. Yeah, he does. Um, well, this is not just Carl Young. Um, uh, if race exists as a sociological phenomenon, which is uncertain. Right. That, that's the qualification. Uh, which you're like, okay, maybe we don't accept race. Maybe we do. I don't know. That's Dugan's answer there. Not important. We're focusing on 1936 to 1945 and abstracting race away. <laughs> <laughs> the middle uh, period. The, the middle, middle period. period. <laughs> uh, as well as the state. According to Dron. Uh, who developed the ideas of Carl Gustav Jung and Gaston Bald Bash Bachelard Bachelard? I'm gonna just mimic Sean there. The <laughs> imagination forms the content of human existence based on the internal, original, and independent structures that are embedded in it. Does anyone smell the whiffs of traditionalist perennialism here? Not sure I know enough about it. Yeah, same. Um so, how many of you know Rene Grenon? A little bit, All but right. like a, a very little bit. Yeah, re regrettable. Jason's flirted with reactionaries, and Sean's like, "What?" <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, I dip my toes in those waters, but I, I don't have the depth of knowledge that some other people. Do. So, Rene Grenon is this Catholic traditionalist who became a Sufi Muslim, but also came up with this idea of of the perennial tradition. So, which is based on the like the imagination inherent to human consciousness, and you can find it by studying the esoteric traditions of the world. Uh, he is very influential on people like Avola, who take it in a more political direction. Guinan is like almost quietistic. He kind of thinks that the true conservative just kind of opts out of modern society entirely and doesn't fuck with anybody. Benedictine, um, yeah. Um. So, anyway. So the imagination forms the content of human existence based on the internal, original, and independent structures that are embedded in it. I do love how in the third hypothesis, he doesn't really tell us what Dasein's important. He just gives us a list of weird, like... <laughs> and then moves on to a fourth. <laughs> yeah. Like, we don't actually understand. Like, I'm like this, th that third hypothesis is like, if we accept Heidegger, a bunch of random shit. <laughs> well, yeah, like... Revolution and the flight of the gods, organization and a house of being. I was like, yeah, sure, that sounds fine. You know? yeah. well, let's let's spend two chapters re restating the, the the main thesis, and then this other part. Let's just you know come up with some bullet points. Doesn't matter if any of it makes any sense at all. I'm gonna name my next book "Revolution and the Flight of the Gods." <laughs> Wagnerian communization Duganism <laughs> with oh, uh, super Max that sounds, characteristics. <laughs> that sounds cooler than it is. <laughs> um, it sounds like like a like like a met like um like a neo black metal band. <laughs> like, <laughs> I would I would listen to that band. I would yeah. at least give them a shot. You know, all yeah. yeah, those artsy leftist ones like uh, <laughs> that come up with what was the one that uh, liturgy. Liturgy and Panopticon are both vaguely leftist, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Isn't it Panopticon who did that one that's like dedicated to coal miners in in uh, in, uh, in Kentucky? Quite possibly. All right. I don't know. So it's funny because this is another. So when it comes <laughs> to when it comes to right wing political figures and when it comes to uh, metal bands, Chris is the guy that should be here. Yeah, <laughs> that's true, actually. He knows, about, he knows about both, and I don't know about either. <laughs> I know a little bit here and there. I'm not a deep thinker on metal or on right-wing thought. Well, I mean, Chris and I can talk metal like we never do, but we, we could. <laughs> you do like, uh, like this is revolution. They have those great, like, uh, you know, music, music episodes. Yeah. We could do a whole, we could do a whole series of on um, culture, like cultural episodes, just, yeah. you know. Was 1985 the best year for metal music? Like oh, why? Yeah. Why is neo folk almost always reactionary, except when it gets tired of being reactionary and just becomes aesthetic? Um, 
<laughs> but also, why is neo folk just awesome? You know, and this yeah. is like the neo folk of philosophy. Actually, it really is kind of <laughs> what the neo folk of philosophy. Yeah, yeah, it kind of is actually. Like I could, I could actually see this stuff quoted in a Def and Juna. <laughs> um, uh, in fact, Revolution in the Flight of the Gods sounds like it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> guardians of being horse wessel too <laughs> so guardians of being yeah that sounds like a like a liturgy a, a liturgy of brazuka album like it's just all right anyway for those of you who don't listen to metal and are, are normally alienated by us talking about first and second international figures and now we're, we're alienating you about talking about obscure metal bands um <laughs> That's the goal, right? Is to try to be to make you fully alienated. That way, you can appreciate how design <laughs> will make you unalienated. <laughs> so, uh, oh, so are we incepting our own like for political theory? Like <laughs> fourth and a half political theory. Oh, it's like the international. You have to, yeah, you have to have a political theory. <laughs> so, <That's>, yeah. <laughs> The fifth international. Wait, are we like? I was trying to count the number of attempts at a fourth international. I was like, aren't we on like the thirteenth international or something? Like, yeah. Well, you <laughs> count the second and a half international in that. I don't know. Yeah, and then the then like the seven anarchist internationals, and then I don't know. Well, <laughs> it's I mean, messy. <laughs> even just by the time the fourth international was founded, there was already the second and a half, the second and a half international, and then the the, con the continuity second international, which is the one that exists today. And then also the London Bureau, which is the third and a half international. So all, <laughs> already the fourth international was like the sixth international. And look, where did the anarchist international meet? In Switzerland. Where does the bourgeois international uh, meet? In Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> all uh, Sean, you should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So. If we interpret the imagination as an autonomous actor in the political sphere. Okay, so we have gotten to the point. This is where, like, I both deeply respect Dugan, but I want people to catch how weird some of this shit is. All right. If we interpret the imagination, the collective imagination, a la uh, Young and, ba and Bachelard, Bash Whatever, yeah, Bachelard. Bachelard. Uh, as an autonomous actor in the political sphere so the collective imagination is an autonomous actor in the okay by the way that would I don't be know the if you most should interpret it that way but... <laughs> i mean that would be like you know what hegel said about the world spirit let's imagine it literally as fuck right like, like... it's just i think it's happening over there it's got nothing to do with us you know is it like a platonic thing? Is it like, are, is there this imaginary that exists in like an essence? Well, it, see, it wouldn't be a, a, it wouldn't be platonic because the platonic or even the Aristotelian being can't act. It's so pure and so it, it actually it's a, like action is actually a problem. Mm. I know this is weird. This gets in really esoteric areas of ancient philosophy, but action is a problem because action implies change. Change implies incompleteness of being. A perfect being in a perfect form cannot be incomplete. Okay. Um, That's why you know Hegel at least tries to uh, resolve that that problem mm -hmm. by having being and not being, like you know, existence and non-existence, as a false duality because there's also the process of becoming, which links being to non-being, both forward and backward. Right, which is to, which is to try to get out of the basically. Hegel's trying to solve the crypto neoplatonism in Christianity. Yeah. I mean, if, if we're being completely frank, um, yeah. uh, and I, I do think Marxists don't appreciate that because they tend to like oh, Hegel, like theology. Fuck that shit. We don't care about Hegel's theology. I'm like, well, it's kind of important to understand what he's doing. I mean, it's um, it's important enough to where if you don't care about Hegel uh, theologically, then you don't actually understand Hegel at all. Agreed. I mean, you can you can disagree with with the the mystical uh you know whatever that whole side of hegel but if you just reject it then you also reject hegel right yeah so all those people who are like hegel's really talking about like epistemology or psychology yeah, it, or he's really just lacan that's all just bullshit frankly yeah. hegel is very clearly not just talking about anything other than what he says he's talking about right all right this is crazy though okay 
right. so if we interpret the imagination as an autonomous actor in the political sphere, including its ability to project, mm. and grant it a sort of legal status, that's quite a big if. Yeah. <laughs> Then we end up with an extraordinary, fascinating, and totally undeveloped trajectory. Maybe because it's insane. But no. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. This is, yeah. I, I feel like I'm doing acid now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, is this tied to? I can't help but think uh, that this is like tied to um, the Schmidt we were talking about earlier, right? Yeah, like the no that yeah. will. Yeah, like he, go, he tries uh, to tie in, people. Yeah. The German people choosing their own subordination yeah. to like the larger. Um, oh yeah, that's Heidegger. But yeah, th this is tied into that. But except, except that it, except that it's in Heidegger, it's a willed thing that you collectively make by the action of choosing it. Uh, Whereas in this, it's an autonomous fucking being. Right. right. It's it's not conjured up by virtue of the 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 melding together of the various will powers of individuals into a collective, and thus. The, it's not it's not a it's not um what's the term whatever this is you know this is hermetic term for, uh i've completely forgotten it what it is anyways it's not that mm -hmm. it's a thing that happens into outside of us an aggregore so, yes it's not an aggregore right right yeah for those of you who don't know that's when you will uh by choosing a, a a belief you actually will it to exist as like a literal monster or whatever but yeah right mm. um okay e this is this gets wild because i think what's going on here is both like a crypto hegelianism world spirit stuff but also like a crypto orthodox theology going on there like we must acknowledge imagination because it's really god guys like we're talking about god here mm. like yeah. right um okay even though the students of 1968 demanded freedom for the imagination, in that moment they were unlikely to recognize the imagination as a contender for a special political subjectivity. Well, I mean, I'm I like wonder... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, they were. That's right. <laughs> they were trapped in the individual as part of liberalism, even if of the left and class, for example, of Marxism, a strictly reconsidered basis, uh, re strictly reconsidered on the basis of psychoanalysis. All right, I, I want to read this last bit and then we're going to stop. But I just want people to like really ponder the idea that the collective imagination as part of the collective unconscious is an actor that can project on its own and we should give legal rights. <laughs> yeah, a legal status to it. It's the same way that we did with Citizens United and granting corporations personhood, except for. <laughs> It's like if the corporations existed outside of us. Oh my god. <laughs> ah, you guys are breaking my brain. Oh. Citizens united, but for the collective unconscious <laughs> autonomous of human beings. Like god. <laughs> see, yeah, see, it's funny because like I, I I did not realize that Dugan was quite this uh out there, you know? Out there, man. Yeah, but I mean it's it's one of these things where people like Dugan's an irrationalist, and you read all you read all the the, the first part, and you're like he really builds this really tight argument, yeah. and then you get to like what his answer is, and you're like, okay, okay, a bunch of weird bullet points. The imagination <laughs> is an autonomous being that deserves legal status. It's wing nut shit. <laughs> you're right. You're right. I think maybe the only way that we reconcile this is by it, it is like a, a, a what do you call synodoc. Mm -hmm. Synopody for God. It's like a stand in for God in this instance. Well, I mean, well, you and know, and, and it's just like how if the fourth political theory was was merely a, a sublated liberalism or a sublated communism or whatever. Yeah. If, if um the imagination as an autonomous being was just God, you know, it wouldn't really be all that crazy. Like he I, doesn't he doesn't have to make it this weird. It, does, it's, it doesn't do anything to help. It doesn't help at all. I actually sort of, it, it is frustrating though, because this is something you used to get from Hegel, where Hegel's like the absolute. I'm like, why don't you just say the absolute is God? We all know you mean the absolute is God. Like, like, um, except for Zizek, apparently, but like everybody else. Um, <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I, I think so. Like, you know, Marx even said, 
Oh yeah, Hegel. Hegel's great, except for you have to turn him on his head. You have to take the rational kernel from the mystical shell. So even Marx like recognized like there's a value to Hegel, even though I don't believe in God. And Zuzek's mm-hmm. like, actually, what he means is this other shit entirely. <laughs> Object oriented ontology, Lacan. Like, <laughs> um, and I'm just like, yeah, Marx was at least at least admitted that, like Hegel was a believer. Right. Um as a side note into the lore of Varn, the first split between Varn and Doug Lane in 2014 was me insisting that you couldn't say that Hegel was not religious. Um, <laughs> 17 splits later. Yeah. You could have an international. You'd have heavy of them. I, I would have uh, probably at least the first half of the 20th century worth of international. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, all right, so in search for the subject of the first political theory, we must boldly enter into a new hermeneutic circle. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Believe Luckily, it or not, this I think that this part makes more sense than everything we've talked about for like the last half no, this, hour. This is actually just standard philosophy, believe it or not. Um, right. That's why I'm uh-ohing, though, because I'm like, oh, we're getting, we've been in the wild shit for now, now we're going to go back to normal philosophy. <laughs> um, I'm going to highlight four- in my text this paragraph here <laughs> to refer back to later <laughs> the four political theory is the whole which naturally has not yet been sufficiently described and defined i mean this is hermeneutic recursion um it can comprised of the ideas of its subject which has been suggested in a preliminary fashion <laughs> Are you preliminary okay i would say it's been suggested in a fashion that starts off logically and then ends in a bunch of bong rips. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I'm going to give you, it is preliminary, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but moving constantly between the uncertainty of the whole and the certainty and the, and the uncertainty of its parts and back again, we gradually been to clarify more precisely what is at stake. And that is a hermeneutic process. I mean, he's absolutely right. That's what you do. Like there's a, there's a circle, which you're, which you are, both looking at the individual part, redefining the whole, going back and redefining the whole to the individual. I did a whole video just so people understand how this hermeneutic thing works. Um, uh, we gradually begin to clarify more precisely what is at stake. The process starting from the standpoint of dismissing that which came before it, the rejection of the old hermeneutic circles, liberalism and the individual, Marxism and the class, fascism, Nazism, and the state race. I think it's weird that he keeps on trying to say fascism because he doesn't want to say he's the fifth position. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, like, the state slash race, are, those are pretty actually different, but whatever. Well, I mean, I, I think he's struggling with, I think, all what all all historians have struggled with and political theorists have struggled with, in which is the difference between Italian fascism and German Nazism, right? Yeah. But he yeah. wants to include both of these within the third position, but by disaggregating them, yeah, he gets into trouble because all of a sudden now you got a, f- uh, a fourth position that isn't your own. <laughs> right. Yeah, because uh, I guess a f- calling for a fifth fifth political theory just sounds, uh, it's like that's too many. It's just it's yeah, messy. It's, it's gilding the lily a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Particularly since two of the political theories would be fascism. Um, right. Just different kinds <laughs> of it. Double fascism. Yeah. All right, which will lead to development of a more constructive idea sooner or later. <laughs> sooner or later is doing a lot of work, buddy. Yeah, 36 pages <laughs> in better be sooner, buddy. <laughs> All right. It's the structure will be further clarified when the hermeneutics come up against the explicitly absurd contradictions, which cannot be resolved. Uh oh, we got admitted contradictions coming up, or else stops corresponding to the real world. I mean, in this way, he sounds like a Hegelian or a Marxist. Like, well, yeah, I mean. I know I said this already, but I really think it would he would make uh, an interesting Marxist thinker if he was not a post-Soviet guy. If only he hadn't been raised on Marxism. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. He also might just be a explicit, you know, fascist. Yeah. Well, he what? Well, he was at one point, even by his own admission, an explicit right. fascist. Yeah. So that's probably uh, something we shouldn't forget. Yeah. And, and and he he also talks about dabbling in Satanism, although he wouldn't have called it that at the time. Um, and now he's found uh, icon Jesus. So, you know, I, I think that's better. You know, oh sure, I mean, I, yeah, probably. I mean, better politically for least, him. 
<laughs> in Russia. Um, <laughs> like if, well, if yeah. we were reading a book about how satanic fascism <laughs> is the way forward, it yeah. might be wilder and, and funnier, but it wouldn't, I don't think it would be quite as uh, interesting. I don't yeah. know if, if Adam Waffen and the Order of the Nine Angles are any indication, it wouldn't be funnier. Yeah, true. Because um, yeah, satanic true. fascism actually does exist. Does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess that's true. Hard Volkish fascism was bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, no, this fascism explicitly hates all life, not yeah. just some. Right. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's more honest, you know? <laughs> true. Uh, and once again, we return to neo folk bands. Anyway, um, <laughs> all right. Is structure will be further clarified when the seminars come. Oh, we already said that. Uh, that is, after starting from a certain point, the development of fourth political theory will begin to develop a scientific and rational characteristics, which, for the time being, are barely discernible behind the power of its groundbreaking intuitions and its revolutionary Herculean task of overcoming old ideologies. Man, he likes stealing our rhetoric. I will say, he likes stealing a good bit of Marxist rhetoric. Great yeah. revolutionary rhetoric, man. Yeah, I also I, I want to say that I don't know if the scientific and rational characteristics are even barely discernible right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, since he starts off with I reject Francis Bacon, <laughs> and the imagination is a is an actor which can project upon the world and has special legal status. <laughs> like, Those are groundbreaking <laughs> intuitions and in the revolutionary super task of <laughs> ideology. It's a beginning, anyway. Uh, all right, we're gonna. Uh, we I would say we should add one more paragraph and then we should end after that because the... okay, let's do the last paragraph. The entire hermeneutic circle, of the fourth political theory, should be included in the fourth nomos of the earth. Okay, we're back to Smith again. This inclusion will specify its content in even more detail and, in particular, reveal its colossal epistemological potential of geopolitics. Asterisk. The current focus on purely geopolitics is another reason why Dugan would have an appeal because his right, own yeah. his view that I that basically these ideologies are like the manifestations of human imagination as being fighting each other on the geopolitical stage. Atlanticism right. versus Eurasianism. Right. Which it which yeah. is an old British imperial theory, right? From the 19th. Yeah. It is. The the difference is that they, that was a pro-Atlanticist vision, and this is a negative one, uh, uh, a non-Atlanticist one. Also, multipolarity comes from that, too, just yeah. for people who don't know. I mean, like, it wasn't like, you know, um, and it, it also, it multipolarity is also kind of implied in Wallerstein as well, because Wallerstein talks about decoupling um, as a good. Um, well, and also, you know, like Dugan, he makes space uh, for the Islamic world. He says yeah. that, that it's a legitimate thing over there and it, it deserves to exist, but it also needs to stay over there. But yeah. At least at least we don't need to go there and change it. When does Duganism really break into the Anglo, I wouldn't say mainstream, but start to have some like, real political presence in like the Anglophone world is when like the fruits of multipolarity start to be seen, you know, on the ground and geopolitically for the subjects of the imperial core in the United States, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean very even of something even, written 14 years ago that's now feels like it's prophetic. Well, yeah, like even recently, like I think even this week he wrote a short essay, uh, you know, talking about developments in the United States, uh, Tucker Carlson and MAGA communism. And, you know, MAGA communism is a thing that I don't think exists, but Dugan very clearly wants it to exist. Yeah. So he's, he at least keep, he's keeping up with the, the with uh, the Atlantic world, at least a little bit. So, well, here's my my interesting. Th I mean, we'll finish this in a second. But um, my interesting thing about this Dugan stuff. Um, Dugan actually has a lot of influence in uh, Islamist uh, spaces in Europe, apparently. Like that apparently is a real area of outreach where he's been successful. The other has been like marginal left forms. I think it's interesting, and I'm gonna. I want you guys to like think about when Dugan has come back up in America, because basically, from my view, from Occupy to the end of Trump round one, um, this stuff was all on hold. 
Mm. Like the entire second period of the millennial left, if we take like the first period of like the Graberite millennial left turning into and the and the early Mark Fisher turning into late Fart Fisher, Curb and Bernie, the DSA, etc. Right. That part of the millennial left. During that shift, all this geopolitics was on hold. Yeah. Like, when you think about the way we talked, like I mean, I know I've complained lately, like the only thing worse about when you guys didn't talk about geopolitics is now that you do talk about geopolitics because you sound like morons and Manichaeans. But um, in a real sense, during that time period, nobody fucking talked about geopolitics except to maybe get a one up on Trump. Like, you know. Uh, well, like, uh, Trump like is they, fucking yeah. around with North Korea. Trump's going to destroy NATO, but. Some vague anti-imperialism around mm-hmm. like what was left of the Iraq War and the and the Afghanistan War. What substituted it seemed to me in that period, which we all lived through, uh, was a sort of vague like internationalist horizontalism. Because right. Like, yeah. You had the movements of the squares. You had the Arab Spring. You had like a series of ruptures. You know, we're all part of the End Notes generation. So that that kind of like I think in a larger Occupy type sense, like took up the position that geopolitics might. And then with the failure of that and the rise of Trump and decoupling or whatever, it comes back in a big way. But it doesn't and, come back for another five years. I don't think it comes back during the Trump administration. I think it comes back during the Biden administration. And what's interesting about this is this picks up what Dugan thought he would be able to do during, or what people who translated Dugan thought they were going to be able to do during the end of the Obama administration. Interesting, yeah. Because yeah, I will tell that's you, right. that's when, like, like when people were in this world, were trying to reach up to people like Caleb Maupin. Mm-hmm. That's when they were doing it. And I know that for a fact. So, so what's funny about that is that what, they, what you know, Dugan was hoping that the 2008 crisis would, would produce is actually produced by the COVID crisis instead. It's very yep. different, very different term, uh, very different contours, but a similar result. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You know, the other thing is like, I don't think Dugan. One thing is a lot of people like, oh, I hear a lot of Dugan stuff and and uh, and uh, Putin when Putin's on Tucker Carlson or whatever. And I'm like, no, I think you guys are hearing Eurasianism and Dugan's like a particular form of it. Actually, I think somewhat conceived for a for a Western audience or at least a European knowledgeable audience. Mm, right. Um. Uh. But like he's what makes him interesting is his attempt to tie all that back in all this like Eurasianist uh, political impulses in Russia into something that can dialogue because the Rusky Mir idea has no like it's not going to have any influence on the rest of us because we're just not part of it. Who gives a shit? Like, um, (laughs) you know, you know, unless you're Russian. So it's interesting what for the grounds it's been. And I think I think it's interesting because I also think the burnout of the movement from horizontalism to populist verticalism and an attempt that like I know people like like Vincent Bevins of like, oh, we haven't really tried, you know, true verticalism. I'm like, people are trying it. It's just becoming sectarian instantly like it did the last time people tried it. Yeah. Um you know, so you like I, I, one of the things I found really frustrating about all these recountments about uh, about the horizontalism of the new left is it totally drops the new communist movement, which was not horizontalist at all. Mm. Right. Like, not at all. Like, and it also had no remotely. pretensions of being so. Right. Like, it was explicitly anti-revisionist or at least old school Trotskyist. And it all kind yeah. of stalls out, dies, or becomes third worldist in the 80s. Right. You know, and that's something for me to think about, right? Well, it what's interesting to me is like this is picking up on a spirit that was very much at the end of the Bush administration and kind of the early Obama administration that the whole millennial left sort of like for some reason we just fucking paused it somehow. Mm. Like whatever processes were going on. And I and I don't just that we can't we can't just blame this on like Occupy or America because you got to also look at Greece you got to look at the UK you got to look at Brazil you got to look at a worldwide Occupy which like in some what ways, was the movement in Spain the Indignados yeah the Indignados and then later Podemos you know yeah. um um 
and well, you and know, for that the, matter, like uh, the Novo Ante Party, uh, the New Anti Capitalist Party, and the yeah. Linka, and yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. there's a whole generation of basically pausing while we worked through uh, our leftover ideas from the last time. Right. And what's interesting, and this is one of the only things Zizek I think is actually insightful on, is that pausing since it was unsuccessful gave also these new right movements that are coalescing here in a book like this from literally almost now a half a generation ago. Yeah. It gave them time to tighten ship. Mm. Yeah, it, it yeah. allowed them to become coherent because on the left, we were just... We were only LARPing, but not in the sense that you were saying earlier. LARPing yeah. in, in, in the non-productive sense. Yeah. Whereas various you know, right-wing thinkers and, and movements, whatever, they were coalescing around uh, new ideas, not just for them, but new ideas in the world. Mm. And the left was like, oh, good, finally, we get to go back to the old ideas. And they did, and also they did everything we did better than us. Like They, they adopted yeah. the populism and actually held a class coalition together that was larger. They, yeah. and, and they actually had a, uh, they developed, which I think Dugan does too in an earlier phase, like a um, geopolitical realpolitik that's actually mm -hmm. different from the leftist realpolitik, which is <clears throat> continued like unipolar rules-based international order, but like nicer. And when you do interventions, you do them like in a, in a, in a better way, like the, the real politique behind Duganism and Euro Eurasianism, right. Is a, a long-term like multi hundred year process of great power jockeying to make sure that Germany and Russia don't create an alliance. And what blows up when the Nord, when the Nord Stream pipeline blows up is the potential for a Eurasian alliance between Germany and Russia something that American planners have been forestalling for a long time. So an alternate geopolitics actually arises over the course of the last three or four Did years. You, are you noticing the parallels that maybe you haven't even noticed yet, Sean? What does that mirror? Tell me. This, this is a post-liberal version of what communist world hoped for in 1918. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep, yep. And, but here we are with our lack of imagination, even the last when they see this, they think it's they think it's that same thing again. They can't imagine that this is not the Cold War and that this is not that multipolarity really isn't the same thing as you know. I mean, on one hand, you know, I'm sympathetic to the idea that the the global north's hegemony is a problem. On the other hand, the idea that you are going to fight that totally from outside or through some other uh, region, not only like totally bucks, even what Lenin did. I mean, Lenin's talking about like you can't support Serbia. Like, as I as I told to someone, Kalski's position, actually, Kalski's position when he made concessions to a war he did not support, all right, was that the German Empire was less reactive than the British and Russian ones and less big. Right, yeah. Right? It was the way people misunderstand revolutionary defeatism today. That's actually Kotsky's position. Like, and people do not realize that. Um. So, you know, and, because, and I think this is because, and I, I want to point this out, what Dugan went for explicitly was the anti-imperialist left. Mm. He know like first the national Bolsheviks, then the anti-imperialists. And that's because of something that my that uh someone I haven't spoke to in 10 years, but he told me once privately, and uh, Carlos Riviera Jones, who's a who's a Maoist, he said, Look, the problem with Maoism and with their worlds and all of it is that it very easily reverts to proletarian nations thinking. And thus to national Bolshevism just being brown. Mm, and you right. know what? That's not a problem for Dugan. Dugan's fine with white or brown national Bolshevism because it's he's not a racialist. And that's yeah. something we have to understand. But if we try to oppose it by like we need the international NATO, but like good, right? Not evil. You know, and, and there are people who think that. I mean, I think that's implicit in some platypus affiliated society thought, frankly. Mm. Well, and and it's it, explicit in a lot of, you know, like uh, workers' liberty and 
yeah, a whole it, a whole big section of the left. Uh, a lot of former Trotskyite uh, Trotskyite yeah. Cliffites, in particular. Yeah. Um, I shouldn't say Trotskyite. Trotskyist. Trotskyite as well. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of former Trotskyist Cliffites and Shackmanites, in particular, hold that view. Right. Um, Which also means the majority of the DSA, to the extent that they have a coherent political orientation, that's what it is. Well, one of the interesting things I think about the majority of this is there's also an undercurrent of it, this third worldist. So uh, international. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's internationalist. One, of the, one of the main yeah, one of the main battles happening right now. It's basically you have the pro and anti NATO faction. My you know, we we privately we were arguing about uh uh third campism, and I was like, look. Third campism is actually the position of the classical Zimmerman left and all that. The problem yeah. is what third campism always becomes post post cold war is actually crypto first campism. Well, yeah. Cause third campism re relies on not just the existence of working people. It, it relies on the existence of the third camp, which is to say a coherent uh, amalgamation of working people in a movement in trade unions and in political parties. Right. The, re the reason why Zimberwald was uh, had an impact on the world is because all of the uh, the uh, participants could go back to their countries and talk about what they wanted to do with the workers in their parties. Right. Whereas the third and campus union, today, man, man. Yeah. yeah, yeah, today you can't just say, well, you know, you got NATO on one side and you got Russia and you know whatever. Uh, Assad and stuff on the other side. Well, we're for the third side. It's like, but there is not currently a third side. You have to make it. You have to get. You have to bring all those people back together. Yeah. Right. You can't Otherwise, just wish it into existence. And the BRICS isn't necessarily a good stand-in for that. No, no, not at all. The BRICS isn't it like viewing the BRICS as a non-aligned movement is like, yeah, but where's the Soviet Union? So right. what are you not aligned with? Right. Either like, Moscow nor Berlin. I don't know where you go. The Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, all this is trying to bring back politics of uh, an understanding of politics, which is more like the 19th century. Although a friend of mine uh, tells tells me that I'm being unfair with that because the 19th century had the ability for this to end up in direct imperial conflagration, uh, whereas today that is too existentially risky for any side to actually do. So what you actually end up in is a 19th century with with kowski's ultra imperial characteristics right right and you want to you want to take something like dugan that dugan's kind of made to like well bust that shit up particularly when you want to deal with something like the russia ukraine war where like objectively speaking there are no good sides but one side is probably subordinated to a worse side than the other mm. We, I mean, by that, but I'm not saying that the Ukrainians are worse than the Russians at all, and I don't believe that actually. But I am saying that how this situation was set up, you know, and I've heard good liberals who I, you know, who are good left liberals who I like on other stuff respond to Putin saying things that are true to Tucker Carlson, as if like, you know, like uh, so, like Zelensky's just a national hero, and and I'm like. Right. Dude, Slutsky is almost getting cooed by his own right. Oh, yeah. Um, which is predictable. That's what I thought was going to happen way earlier. I thought that was going to happen in like 2022. That's what the whole Zeluzhny thing was about, was Zeluzhny was keeping all of the good troops, all the good reserves in the ultra-nationalist battalions uh, closer to Kiev, just in case something were to happen. And so everybody else wants to bring new soldiers into the ranks. And Zelensky's like, well, we got all these good soldiers, these right wingers. Why aren't we putting them into battle? He's like, oh, we need them for other things. Who no, right. potentially the sword of Damascus over the, over their head? I mean, and you have this weird situation in uh, in Russia where, in the last year, you first saw the Re the Russian ruble go from really strong to really weak, but then you saw the Russian economy really kick up in the overdrive to produce munitions and whatnot, which of course it would. However. I want people to look at the long durée of war economies. Like, you know, we talked, you talked about this on your show. Israel tried that in the 60s. It works for about a couple of years. It don't work for long. Well, yeah, um, just like the it worked in the US in the 40s and 50s and 60s, but then yeah. 
it didn't work at all and you got stagflation and then you had to neoliberalize and you had to I mean, basically bust up the whole order. Well, I mean, the, the other thing I would say is like the actual war economy worked, but only for like five years, like because we immediately shifted the war economy back to domestic production and oh, Keynesian yeah. that, internationalism. Like um, it could there, work the European Union, maybe. I mean, they, they're going to have to do it anyways. So maybe they'll get a little burst of military Keynesianism. Well, the thing is, the irony is, it looks like we've exhausted our military Keynesianism, but everybody else is doing is bringing theirs back. However, the other irony is, if Peter Zaya is not wrong, um, that the United States is actually economically positioned. It's not politically positioned. I want to be very clear on that. I'm not saying things are going to go well for us, um, but it's economically positioned for the first time to be the the person that weathers the storm and not China, right? And that's a new phenomenon. And that's messing up everybody's assumptions. I think that's why a lot of people who were all in on the China game and maybe a little skeptical of Russia are like, well, maybe Russia's military Keynesianism is actually communism. I'm like, how fucking desperate are you? <laughs> like, that's a good place to leave it. I, my alarm goes <laughs> off pretty soon. I got to, I got to check. But yeah, this was this one was really super fun, and you guys can continue talking if you'd like. But I, I gotta I gotta split. So no, we'll stop here. We'll yeah, stop I think here. we should stop All here. Right. All right. Next call. next we can approach the problem of creating the fourth political theory from another direction and examine the contenders for inclusion in this theory from you know and so on. And Not I'm gonna now, think, but next now before, before I go to sleep, I'm gonna take an edible and think about the collective imaginary as an autonomous <laughs> subject. <laughs> You're gonna figure out how to like you know. What kind of legal status it needs. Yeah, how we're giving it legal rights. <laughs> All right, on that note, we're out.